Hi, and welcome to our course on impact evaluation. I'm Summer Allen, a Senior Research Coordinator in the Markets, Trade, and Institutions Division of IFPRI. This course relies upon course materials that were prepared by Manuel Hernandez for use in Guatemala and the experience and input of researchers at IFPRI. Some helpful materials also used from the references cited and linked at the end of each unit. In this introduction, we will respond to the following questions. What do we mean by impact evaluation? When should we prioritize impact evaluation? Why is impact evaluation important? Who should do the impact evaluation? And what are the problems we face in terms of evaluation? The idea of this introduction is that we will have a better understanding and a broad overview of the use of monitoring and evaluation as well as impact evaluation methods. When we discuss impact, what do we mean? We are looking for the effect of a program, intervention, or policy. Impact evaluation is the measurement of a change in a specific result or outcome that can be attributed to an intervention or program. The critical word here is attributed. For example, if the Ministry of Agriculture implements an agriculture extension program, the impact evaluation would allow us to estimate the change to far farmer incomes that was due to the participation in this extension program. Another example would be in the case that the Ministry of Health decides to construct a health care center in a community impact evaluation would permit us to determine the change in infant mortality, for example, in that community due to the construction of the health center. Impact evaluation requires us to find an appropriate comparison that would represent what would have occurred in the absence of an intervention. This is also called the counterfactual which we will discuss in more detail later in the course. In other words, the objective is to be able to assign any observed change to the intervention, controlling for the other factors that could be responsible for the changes. For example, in the case of the Agricultural Extension Program, the farmers that participate might have had income changes as the result of other factors such as a good harvest year because of a favorable climate. And we will see that they have improved their production regardless of the participation of the extension program. We want to control for these other factors so that we can determine what part of the change in their incomes was specifically the result of the extension program. It is an, it's very important to understand the intervention logical framework. This includes the inputs, outputs, results, and impacts that we hope to see. And this helps us di differentiate between monitoring and impact evaluation. In the end, we're asking the questions, what is it that the program tried to change? And what do we want to evaluate? Considering another example, we can think about a training program for youth that was implemented in Guatemala. In this case, the impact evaluation will not answer if the youth that participated in the program increased their incomes, but rather what part of the income increases could be contributed to the participation in the program. Remember that we have to control for all other factors that could explain the income changes for the participants in order to be able to determine the part of the change that was the result of the participation in the program. It is important to distinguish between monitoring and impact evaluation. And for that, it's helpful to look at the logical framework. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the results? And what are the expected impacts? Let's consider the following example to better understand this. Imagine an NGO wants to provide seeds to local farmers. 
In this case, the input is the seeds. The output would be the seeds being sent to the farmers. The result is that the farmers use the seeds. The impact in the short run is that the farmers produce more and the impact in the medium term is that these farmers have higher food security and market opportunities. For this example, monitoring would include assuring that the seeds actually arrived and that the farmers are using them or not. The impact evaluation would include the measurement of yield and if it improved or not based upon the seeds provided. However, attribution can be challenging since the yield might have improved due to other factors. For example, additional government support for irrigation infrastructure during that year. We would want to control for these other factors so that we can know for sure if the improved yields were a result of the improved seeds provided by the NGO and for this reason we use impact evaluation. Monitoring can be repeated measurements or monitoring of the process. This monitoring of the receipt and the use of the seeds, but impact evaluation is looking towards the impact of an intervention. Monitoring as well can be considered a process evaluation. It is a process to inform implementation and management of a program or policy. The focus here is on inputs and outputs. In contrast, evaluations are objective assessments of policies, programs, or projects. An impact evaluation is a quantitative measurement of impact or the causal effect of the program. It estimates change in outcomes attributable to the program. There are some similar starting points for monitoring and evaluation. We start with a development problem. For example, production is low due to drought. We determine a desired outcome, improved food security. We propose a potential solution, providing improved seeds. We can then monitor the program, asking if the services are being delivered, how effectively, and the satisfaction with the service. If we were going to do an impact evaluation, we would ask whether the farmers produced more as a result of the improved seeds, who produced more, and how outcomes changed or would change if we changed the design. So when should we use impact evaluation? We would use impact evaluation when we have a desired outcome we want to evaluate. We would use it when there are similar projects, programs, policies that propose solutions but have divergent or conflicting results, or there is no clear understanding of the impact. When we have scarce resources for alternative options of investment, which is usually the case. For innovative in interventions and pilot programs that, if proven successful, can be taken up to scale or duplicated. And we can also use it for interventions with a higher risk profile. Why do we do impact evaluations? An impact evaluation allows us to decide if we should continue or suspend a program. It allows us to understand what is working and what is not working and for which parts of the population it's working best, as it might have unexpected impacts in non-targeted areas of the population. Impact evaluation can also assist in understanding how to best replicate in another area or scale up a pilot program. It helps us in reporting to donors and also back to the communities. Who should do an impact evaluation? 
an impact evaluation should be done by an external evaluator or team, mainly because they have more experience and expertise and they will be considered unbiased and credible. If it is not possible to have an external team, it could be an internal team that conducts the impact evaluation, but it would need to be a division or unit that is not part of implementing part of the organization. The benefit of this is they are likely to be more familiar with the context of the program, but we will need to ensure their independence. The final option could be a combination of the two in which the monitoring is done by the internal team and the external team conducts the evaluation. So what is the problem of evaluation? Ultimately, it is a problem of a counterfactual. In other words, each person only has one path they can take at a time. If we look at an example of a program, there are participants and non-participants. These participants can be measured before the program and after the program, as we see in state A and state C. The non-participants can be measured before the program, state B, and after the program, state F. The boxes in blue we can observe and measure as such. However, we most want to know what state D would be, what the participants would have been like if they had not participated in the program. But this is not possible as they are participating. We then try to estimate this difference in state C and state D using state F from non-participants, which we will discuss more soon. Viewing this in another way, we can see the y-axis represents income and the x-axis time. We have observations of individuals pre-intervention shown by point A and post-intervention, shown by point B. The counterfactual, point C, shown here, is the gain in the income if the intervention had not taken place. Therefore, the impact would actually be only the difference between Y and Y star. Because the counterfactual is not observed, we need a comparison group that is identical to the treatment group to estimate Y star that we cannot observe directly. To estimate the impact, there are a number of methods. One way is the simple comparison between the incomes of the participants before and after the intervention. The problem is that we are ignoring the other components that might have influenced the incomes that were not related to the program. Using the example of agricultural extension, if there is a drought in the community the previous year and the year of the intervention there is a sufficient amount of rain, the harvest will be better and so will the incomes for the participants. However, this change was independent of the participation in the extension program. Of course, there are also other factors that could change between these two measurements, so we are attributing all of the change in income to the participation and extension when in fact this is not correct. If we return to the graphic we saw earlier, we can see this overestimation. If we used Y0 and Y1 as our pre and post measurements of income, we would be overestimating the change in income due to the program. The part participants would have reached the income at Y1 star without the extension program. The impact of the extension program is only the difference between points B and C. To construct the counterfactual, we must find a comparison group. However, this group cannot just be any group that non did not participate or did not receive the treatment. It must be as similar as possible to the group that did receive the program, the target or treatment group. The control group, if similar enough to the treatment group, 
would then allow us to estimate what would have happened to the treatment group without the program. You can imagine in the example of a good harvest year, the control group would be equally affected. Of course, to assure that our control group can be used in this way, we need to consider the observable and non-observable indicators. When we think about observable characteristics of the participants that we need to control for, it could include the factors that make them eligible for the program. In the case of the extension program, perhaps it is their age, the type of crop they are growing, their production or income level, etc. We would want to look for a control group with the same characteristics. On the other hand, there are unobservable characteristics that are more difficult to control for. These could include the fact that some individuals might self-select into the extension program. For example, farmers that have more interest in marketing. In other words, the individuals that register for a program are also more likely than others to succeed. This can bring selection bias, and we need to control for this bias when we are evaluating in order to avoid underestimating or overestimating the impact of a program. If we were to represent the selection bias on the same graphic we saw earlier, the area of income between point C and point E is due to selection bias. The group we selected is not of average interest or ability. In this case, if we just took a cross section of the same group, we would be overestimating the impact if we assumed point B, the area between point B and point E was the impact rather than the area between B and C. In every impact evaluation, it is important to consider and try to control for selection bias. As you can see, the biggest challenge we face when trying to estimate impact is the need to take into account the unobservable factors to avoid under or overestimating the impact of a program to control for or reduce the selection bias, we use a number of different methods, including both experimental and quasi-experimental methods, in which we will discuss in the next units. We face a few other challenges to impact evaluation. For example, we might have a program or intervention that is very beneficial to one group of the population, but not necessarily beneficial to another group of the population. There are also cases that a program has a package of interventions and we have to decide if we will try to eva evaluate only one part of the package or the total package and the challenges we will face accordingly. For example, in the case of agricultural extension, the extension might be provided along with agricultural inputs. Do we want to evaluate the extension and input separately or together? We need to consider the complementarities that exist between these components in this case. The third challenge we want to mention is that we are not doing evaluation in a controlled environment. Other programs and factors in a community can influence the outcome we are trying to measure. If we do not take these programs or influences into account, we will be overestimating the impact of the program. Finally, we face the risk that even though we may have a control group, which is our group that is not exposed to the program to help estimate the counterfactual, we normally get this group from nearby. In that case, it could be that our control group is inadvertently exposed to the program. If we did not control for this, we would end up underestimating the impact of the program. And we'll talk more about this in the following units. We'll be looking more into the details of these challenges in the next few units but it is recommended that you seek out the range of helpful information that exists on impact evaluation. Some of that material is listed here as references. After a short quiz on what you've learned, we will continue to Unit 2 where we will discuss experimental methods and in particular randomized controlled trials.